You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. In 2003, Kathleen Forbig was sentenced to 40 years in jail for the murder of three of her children and the manslaughter of her fourth. She was described at the time as Australia's worst female serial killer. And this week, she was pardoned of all of her crimes. And so considering Mr Bathurst's conclusion that he is firmly of the view that there is reasonable doubt as to Ms Fobig's guilt, I consider that his reasons establish exceptional circumstances of the kind that weigh heavily in favour of the grant of a free pardon, and that in the interest of justice, Ms Fobig should be released from custody as soon as possible. And so uh, this morning at 9.30, I met with the governor I recommended that the Governor should exercise the raw prerogative of mercy and grant Ms Folbig an unconditional pardon. The Governor agreed. Ms Folbig has now been pardoned. Late last year, I sat down with Jane Hansen, who is a senior reporter at the Sunday Telegraph and who has been covering this case for many years and has made a podcast about it. Jane did countless hours of research on this case. She's spoken to Kathleen's friends, listened to court transcripts and taken into account new breakthroughs in the case that clearly changed the mind of a judge. And after talking to Jane in this episode, changed my mind completely. So I'm popping it back into your feed today so you can remind yourself of Kathleen's story and how we got it so, so wrong. This is a woman who has spent 20 years pretty much in solitary confinement for four murders she didn't commit. When Kathleen Donovan was 15, she discovered she was adopted. That's a lot for any 15-year-old to take in. But for Kathleen, it wasn't even half of the story. Because around that time, she also discovered that her biological father had murdered her mother on a Sydney street. Kathleen was just 18 months old at the time. Soon after, Kathleen had been placed in a permanent foster home in Newcastle. When she was 20, Kathleen fell in love and married a man called Craig, and she took his surname. 16 years later, Kathleen Folbig was described as one of Australia's worst serial killers and was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Folbig was convicted in 2003 of the murders of Patrick, Sarah and Laura and the manslaughter of her firstborn, Caleb, over a 10-year period. She has spent 19 years behind bars, but convicted child killer Kathleen Folbig denies that she's responsible for her baby's deaths. From Mamma Mia, I'm Mia Friedman, and you're listening to No Filter. In 2003, Kathleen Folbig was found guilty of the murder of three of her children, Caleb, Sarah and Laura, and for the manslaughter of her second child, Patrick. All of these crimes were committed between 1989 and 1999. The Crown argued Folbig smothered each of her children because they were an irritant and got in the way of her going to the gym and socialising, and sleeping. But what if the courts got it wrong two decades ago? Kathleen Folbig is still in jail, and most people believe that she's guilty. Jane Hansen is the Sunday Telegraph senior reporter and the host of the new podcast Mother's Guilt, which examines Kathleen's crimes. Jane's done countless hours of research on this case, speaking to Kathleen's friends, listening to court transcripts, reading Kathleen's diaries and taking into account new breakthroughs in science and psychology. Until this conversation, I thought I had a very fixed opinion about Kathleen Folbig. But now, I have to say I've changed my mind. There's a new inquest that's going on right now into Kathleen's case after new scientific evidence has emerged. And what it seems to be showing is that we may have got it very, very wrong about Kathleen Folbig. Jane, tell me about Kathleen Folbig's life before she became a mother. Because it wasn't easy, was it? No. In fact, she was born into the most horrible domestic violence. Her father was, Jack Britton, was a standover man, a warfie. He had already attempted murder on the woman he was with beforehand. He'd slashed her throat and he'd spent some time in jail. And then he met Kathleen Donovan, which is Kathleen Folbig's 
mother. Mm. Kathleen Donovan left him and left Kathleen with him. And early reports seem to think that she was sexually abused by him. But he slashed his previous wife's throat, but he stabbed Kathleen Donovan to death in an Annandale Street because she left him. So what happened She was 18 months old. She was then put into the Pratt family, which was her mother's sister, and they couldn't cope with her behaviour. She was only 18 months old and obviously she'd already developed behavioural issues. She must have been deeply traumatised. Deeply traumatised. Then she ended up in Badura Children's Home where her playing out and acting out was noted Mm. by child health authorities. And then she was fostered out at age three, to the Marlborough family in Katara, Newcastle. So this was in the 70s, yeah, late 60s, early 70s. Mm, mm. She came into this foster family when she was three. Mm-hmm. What was her life like after that? Did she have siblings? Yeah, Did, she had an older sister. Childhood? She had an older sister and she, or oh, foster sister, much older foster sister that she was very close to. But she left home and then she was the only one in the home, which was a very, very strict Deidre was a very strict taskmaster and she went to Katara Primary, she went to Katara High, she had a girl squad group of friends that mm-hmm. still stick by her to Up this in day. Newcastle, yeah. yeah. She didn't find out about her tragic background until she was about 15. Did she know that she was adopted or that she'd been she fostered? She thought she'd been adopted, but at that point she found out that she hadn't been adopted, that she was still a foster child. And I think there was a there was a fair bit of argument with her foster mother at that point because Kathleen was rebellious, she was 16, 17, all her friends were going out, she wasn't allowed to. So I think at 17 she actually left home and she moved in with a friend, Billy Jo Bradshaw, mm-hmm. who was living with her mum. And when she was staying there, that's when she met Craig Folbig. So she was really young when she got married. She was only 20, wasn't mm, she? Mm, yeah. When did they have their first baby? Within two years. So she was only 22 when Caleb was born. And then at 19 days of age, he was dead. How did he die? Well, the autopsy says sudden infant death. But he also had a floppy larynx. So they had realised that when Caleb was feeding that he'd hold his breath and then he'd stop and, and take gulps of breath. So a floppy larynx is, you know, where the tissue around the, the windpipe can mm. collapse. And it is in the literature associated with sudden infant death. This was in the 80s. Mm. SIDS was a lot more mysterious than it is now and it was a lot more prevalent because they didn't know things like if you put your baby on their stomach or certain mm. blankets that you have or safe sleeping. toys mm. or safe sleeping. that There was no understanding of the connection between yeah. safe sleeping. So more kids did die of SIDS and it was obviously a tragedy but not incredibly uncommon at that time. Mm. How did she react? How did Craig react? Obviously they were devastated. Yeah, and I haven't been able to speak to Kathleen, unfortunately, yeah. but I just did read through the ambulance reports. Like each of the paramedics that came to each of their children's deaths wrote about mm. how these people were reacting while they were trying to tend to these babies. And they all described the woman that's sitting there rocking in shock or in tears or crying. Mm. So she, I mean, it sounds appalling to even say this, but she was clearly distressed. Mm. How soon after that did she become pregnant again? Uh, within two years she'd had Patrick. What did her friend say about that time after Patrick was born? She told her friend, Megan Donegan, that she was terrified that she'd lose Patrick. And of Megan, Megan told me in the podcast, look, you know, I said... It's never going to happen again. The chances of it happening again are just minimal. I mean, forget it. Just enjoy your baby. And were they minimal, Jane? Like everyone said to her, SIDS is a freak thing. Mm. It's not going to happen again. Is that what she was told? Yeah. And is that what the the medical belief was at that time? Yeah. Well, the chances are of a SIDS baby now is one in a thousand. The chances of your second one is one in a thousand. Chance of a third one is one in a thousand. So it doesn't go down. No, That's interesting. No, because at the time you might remember, well, I'm old enough to remember that there was a fellow by the name of Professor Roy Meadows. He was a paediatrician in the UK and he'd come up with this idea and it was just his opinion. He opined that one sudden infant death was tragic, two was suspicious, three was murder until proven otherwise. 
So a whole bunch of women in the late 90s and early 2000s in the UK and Canada and the US who had more than one sudden infant death were tried and convicted. So there was Angela Cannings, Tropti Patel, Sally Clark, Donna Anthony. These women had had two or three sudden infant deaths and they were charged with murder. Now, he blew himself up spectacularly when he said the chances of having three sudden infant deaths was one in 75 million, which was more than the UK population at the time. And here we had several women that had had more than that. And the Royal Statistical Society pulled him up and said, where did you get that statistic from? Because your chances don't change. Your chance of winning lotto is the same as winning it again. So, Right, that's so interesting yeah, that yeah. you don't have less chance if you've won it before mm. or more chance if you've won it before. It's the same because it's that's random. In the, that's in the broad population. Mm. But if you have one sudden infant death now, your chances of having another one are higher because of what we know now about genetics. So your chances of having another SIDS death, and you know mums that have, I preface this by saying this is distressing, that you, you have a fourfold chance of having another one because we now understand that genetics are responsible for anywhere between 10 and 35% of SIDS deaths. And the other percentage of SIDS deaths are more likely caused by environmental factors yeah. that we weren't aware of perhaps before. Number one, tobacco smoke. Mm. Really? Mm. What, in the air, mm. in the... Yeah. Wow. Okay, so none of this was known back in the 80s. No. She had... Caleb had died tragically at less than three weeks mm -hmm. old. She'd become pregnant again because I imagine that was the advice at the time. It's mm -hmm. never going to happen again. Go home, get pregnant. Yep. She gave birth to Patrick. How long did Patrick live? Well, Patrick died at eight months of age, but at four months of age, he had what's called an acute life-threatening event. So she tended to him, Kathleen tended to him, and he was floppy and, and blue. She screamed. Craig got up. They started CPR, called the ambulance. The baby was taken to hospital and he was diagnosed with encephalitis of some unknown cause at this point. It's like swelling of the brain. Yeah, yeah. So this also could have been, and testimony was given, that this could have been his first epileptic fit. Mm. So he developed epilepsy after that. He was blind after that and he died of intractable seizures four months later. And what surprises me about that, she was found guilty of manslaughter, that this was a failed smothering attempt. So that's never sat well with me. I don't know how that ever washed. So when she was charged, they tried to say that at four months his episode was caused by her trying to murder him. Mm. What evidence was there for that? That he died four months later and that three other children in the family were dead. So there's been holes in the... Circumstantial. Yeah, yeah. There's smarter people than me that, that are legal professionals that say there were holes in this case from the start. The time between four months when he had that episode mm. and eight months, did they know how brain damaged he'd been yes. left by that episode? Yes. So that's so he was another blind. incredible blow mm. to Craig and Kathy. Yeah. He was blind. He was suffering many seizures, like obviously couldn't get them under control with medication, and then he died. What were the circumstances of his death? Was he once, in hospital? Once again, no, found him at home in his crib. Deceased. And she found him? Yeah. She always found the children because they were very traditional. Craig was a heavy sleeper. He had sleep apnea. This testimony was given in 2003 that he, he didn't get up to the children because he'd argued well, he had to go to work the next day. So she always got up to the children. She always found them. It's interesting that one of the things that became so damning and part of this circumstantial evidence was that she was always alone with the children when they died, but she was a stay-at-home full-time mother with a baby. Mm. You know, why would that be unusual? That would not mm. be unusual. I've got the opening statement here from Mark Tedeschi. I just want to read this to you because I wonder whether it would wash in 2022. This is Tedeschi talking about motive. She was constantly tired, resentful against her husband Craig for not providing her with what she considered to be adequate help. And she was constantly, constantly preoccupied to an exaggerated degree with her weight gain due in part to the fact she couldn't get to the gym 
as much as she liked because of her children and the Crown case is that she either intended to kill them during a flash of anger, resentment and hatred against her children or alternatively that she deliberately sought to render them unconscious in an attempt to put them to sleep so that she could get to sleep and have some time to herself. Ooh, what do you think when you hear that in 2022? <laughs> uh, I relate to that. I think every mother that's ever had yeah. infant children feels that way you know they're tired they're stressed you love your children sometimes you she, yeah the um, world tells us not to be fat after having babies that we've got to bounce back yeah and i just think half of australia's mothers would go oops i feel that way but that doesn't make me a murderer tell me about craig and kath's relationship what was he like what were they like together uh, from what I can tell, because I've not spoken to either of them, Craig's refused to, to have anything to do with uh, this new inquiry. He, in fact, turned on her in 2003. They were separated. They were estranged. And they'd broken up quite a few times after the three children had died. They got back together when Laura was conceived. And then after she died, they'd again broken up. So they were estranged at the time that he'd gone to police and said, look, I've read her diary entries and I'm concerned. So they weren't in a good place then. Were but they before ever? that, mm. before that, he was very supportive of her and he never, ever, ever thought that she had mm. anything to do with the deaths of the children. I want to talk more about him in a moment, but let's talk about Sarah, who was born next, the, mm. their third child. How long after Patrick died was Sarah born? A couple of years, I think three years. She was born healthy, beautiful she had all the sleep studies done because of the history. She slept on a apnea monitor. So they had SIDS monitors by that time for yeah, kids who were perceived yeah. to be high risk. Yeah. I remember when I had my first or second child, those SIDS monitors had started to become available and mm. I remember quite a few people I knew were getting them and mm. I thought about should I get one as well because mm. I was so anxious mm. and so stressed about the prospect of SIDS. And some friends who had them said, look, they sometimes go off. The mm. alarm goes off by accident because it basically is a thing that goes under your mattress and it detects the baby move and yeah. if the baby's not moving, an alarm goes off. And I ended up not doing it, but it was quite a thing around that time. You could buy one if you wanted to, but you would be provided one if your baby was at at risk. Yeah. So Craig and Kathleen did have discussions about this because he liked it. He found it comforting. Yeah. But she found it going off all the time traumatised her because oh. she was terrified of finding another dead baby, of course. And it goes off often. Like it would go off not infrequently is my understanding. Yeah. So Sarah was sleeping, like were they using one of these sleep apnea monitors or not? Yeah, they were. She was in the room as well. So the testimony over Do you Sarah, mean she slept in the room? Yeah, she slept with the in baby. the room. Yeah. So the testimony about Sarah, Craig and Kathleen tell different stories. We don't know which one's quite right. Craig says he got up in the middle of the night and he saw that Sarah wasn't in the room and Kathleen wasn't in the room and there was a light on in another room. And then he changed his testimony about that. He originally said that she was in the room. And anyway, no one quite knows what the truth was. But again, Kathleen found the baby still warm to the touch, but dead, screamed. Ambulance was called. The paramedics describe a woman inconsolable while they're trying to revive her, and she was dead at 10 months. The autopsy report confirmed sudden infant death syndrome. Now, that's a process of elimination. There was no other mm. obvious cause, so sudden infant death was found to be the cause of that death. Did that used to be a sort of a... Process a of term, elimination. Yeah, mm. like, like we don't know why, mm. so we'll call it sudden infant death yeah. syndrome, which means we don't know why. Yeah, exactly. So no obvious cause. So after the third baby died, were there rumours that maybe she'd been responsible? Were her no. friends starting to become suspicious? No. Was Craig? No, no one at that point. Everyone thought it was just a terrible tragedy. Yeah, and then their relationship was quite up and down after that. There'd been a couple of separations, which is the standard way it goes after you lose a child. It really is a personal It's a much higher risk Holocaust. of um, yeah. a relationship breaking yeah. down. Yeah, because right? essentially because men and women grieve differently. Mm. Happened to me. Mm. You and I both know. We're both members of that club. We are, yeah. yeah. My marriage broke down after that. Yeah. And I think for that reason. 
Yeah. I mean, I don't think that grieving mothers are particularly sexy, <laughs> to put it mildly. <laughs> That's all. least. Funnily enough, it's not high in our list of priorities. No. But I also just think no one else can understand. No. And I think. Except other women who've yeah, been through it. Exactly. I mean, even you would know even some of your girlfriends would be really uncomfortable with your grief. Yeah. Some friends are really uncomfortable with your grief. And, yeah. You know, can you just get back to being Jane? Or <laughs> How old was your baby when you lost them? Oh, when my first boy, Thomas, was born at 20 weeks. Oh, Jane. You know, too early. And then my second son, he was born at 26 weeks and put up an amazing battle and died at eight months of age from chronic lung disease. And this was around the time Kathleen Folbeck had just been jailed. So I... I remember saying to one of my friends, how is she still alive if she lost four babies? Because I found the grief life-threatening. If she was innocent, how could she lose four babies and be blamed for it and still be yeah. alive? Like yeah. I, I remember saying that. <sighs> Did your second son make it home from hospital? Yeah, for six weeks. I'm <laughs> so sorry. That's okay. He was a beautiful, beautiful boy. A mighty child who just changed my life forever. In what way? Well, I never knew a love like that to begin with. And a love, if you have a sick child and a tiny fragile child, like he was 900 grams when he was born and, and then the whole NICU journey and apneas where they stop breathing and it's a minefield. And then I got to take him home after 117 days. And then, you know, he was six weeks old and he caught a cold or he was home six weeks and he caught a cold and... Then we went back to hospital, then he had pulmonary hypertension and then it was just a cascade of things and infections and then eventually, you know, lungs incompatible with life, I think was the term the doctor used. Oh, Jane. Yeah. The pregnancy just with him after losing Thomas mm. must have been... Six months on bed rest. <laughs> yeah, but it's the head fuck of, of it, isn't oh, it? Oh, God, yeah. Pregnancy after the terrifying loss or premature birth. Yeah. You've gone on to have more children. I had one more, snuck in there at 11 minutes to midnight. How was that process for you after all of that trauma? Oh, gosh, really confronting. Because I remember this pregnancy with, with Sam, who's now 17, I just felt like my life depended on it getting mm -hmm. him across the line. So I did. I spent six months on bed rest to, to get him to 38 weeks, which was a miracle in itself. And then when he was born, it was this bittersweet, how wonderful is this, but I feel, feel so ripped off that Jackson didn't get it, didn't get a normal birth and, yeah. and that. And, and, and so as you would know, that, that rainbow baby, it's this, this, yeah. this bittersweet thing all the way through, first day at school, my other child didn't get to experience that. Yeah. Turning a teenager, my first child didn't get to experience that. So it just becomes part of your fabric that you've got this little, little living ghost. shadow inside you, the little it's ghost that, that grows in age as well. Yeah. That's yeah. the weird thing, isn't it, mm. when you celebrate birthdays and you go, they would have been five and they mm. would have been seven and they would have been 21. Yeah. It's hard and weird. Mm. And really confronting. I find the birthdays really hard. It sounds so ridiculous to anyone who hasn't gone through what you have gone through and I'm so envious that you got to hold your baby and meet him mm. and spend time with him because I didn't. And mm. I'm sorry. Isn't, but isn't that funny going, I'm so jealous of you yeah. that your baby died at eight months instead yeah. of, yeah. you know. Lucky 20, you got eight months. 20 yeah. weeks, yeah. yeah. Exactly. You're mm. so lucky mm. and it's all relative, isn't it? But, you know, the trauma – that Kathleen must have been feeling, and I want to get to that in a second, but after Sarah's death, they separated. They then got back together and conceived Laura. Now, There was four years, four years in between, I think, after losing Sarah. Mm -hmm. Laura's first birthday, what was that like? Well, they wrote that it was bigger than a wedding. It Why? was a huge party because they thought at that point that she was beyond the SIDS risk. They thought they'd broken the curse. Yeah, they did. And then what happened? Well, interestingly, around that age, Kathleen had a friend through Craig's work 
He worked at a car yard in Singleton. And this friend, Karen Hall, when she found out that Kathleen was pregnant, she she went and did CPR because, you know, just as a gift to her. So she was the only one that Kathleen would let look after. She wouldn't let Laura. anyone who wasn't CPR trained look yeah. after her baby, would yeah. she? And so Karen was looking after this child, Laura, at about 12 months of age. Kathleen went to run some errands. And she said, I, I only ever let Laura sleep near me. So she, if she was going to have a midday nap, she had it on the couch next to me while I was watching TV and I could watch her the entire time. Anyway, the phone rang. She picked it up. It was Kathleen checking on her. Uh, she, she said she's on her way home. And then Karen talks to me in the podcast about how she walked back in and she saw Laura was blue, unresponsive, not breathing, And she scooped her up and she put her on the floor and she just started doing what she'd been trained to do and started CPR. And at that point, Laura took a huge breath and and came to. So fast forward now where you've got this scientific suggestion that the two girls had a genetic mutation that causes cardiac arrhythmia. The world expert in that is, is Professor Peter Schwartz. He's an expert in cardiac arrhythmias and this particular genetic mutation that's been found. He has written a report that that was likely Laura's first cardiac arrhythmia. And had she not, Karen not walked in the room at that point, she probably, you know, left it four more minutes, Laura might have died then. Not when she was with Kathleen. That's right. She died at 18 months and three weeks. Again, it was during the day this time, Kathleen had... um, They'd had a rough morning. They'd had a bit of an argument with Craig. Laura was playing up. Uh, Laura had a cold at the time. And then they'd gone in to see Craig and, you know, Laura was fine. And then she'd come home, put her to bed and checked on her at about 2.30 after she heard a cough and again she was unresponsive. Now at this point Kathleen scooped up the child, started CPR, was calling triple zero at the same time whilst doing CPR. And again I read through the ambulance reports and the paramedic was saying this woman was, was just inconsolable, in crying, saying, I've already lost three, I've already lost mm-hmm. three. Now, I don't know, if she's guilty, why would she, you know, why would she be like that? She'd be a bit more cold, I would think. Anyway, got to keep an open mind on these things. But um, I've heard that ambulance call. It's absolutely gut-wrenching. Yeah. How long after that was she arrested? And what led to That was nineteen ninety nine. She was arrested. Well, after that, Alan Carla, Dr. Alan Carla did the autopsy. And he found myocarditis, which can cause death at that age. She had myocarditis because she had a viral infection at the time and the inflammation of the heart. Yeah. So yeah. he found that at the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But because he knew of the other three deaths, he marked her death as undetermined, and then went on to say, I can't rule out suffocation and homicide because of the other three deaths. But that isn't, like, I'm not a scientist, but he was asked to do the autopsy on one baby, not make Mm. assumptions based on other babies. And this is how Meadows Law entered (sighs) the trial in 2003. So when he'd marked it undetermined and he'd written that, then the police had to act. Yeah. So they brought her in for questioning and, you, you you know, they've asked her if she's killed all her children. And I don't know whether you've heard that, but that's oh, a I lot. have. It's just... She's oh, just oh. beaten down. Yeah. Do you know what sort of person would kill four children? I have no comprehension. I don't even want to think about it. Cathy, did you kill Caleb? No. Did you kill Catherine? No. Did you try to kill Patrick on that near miss episode? No. Did, did you kill Sarah? No. And did you kill Laura? No. Then they charged her with murder, four counts of murder, which was changed to three counts of murder and one count of manslaughter with, you know, the failed suffocating attempt on Patrick. Now... There was absolutely no forensic evidence of suffocation, smothering, none. No marks around the face. I was going to say, what would evidence of that be? Well, Alan Carla gave evidence in the trial saying that you can't tell the difference between smothering and sudden infant death. 
because you can use something soft to smother a child. But there were no fibres in the throats or particular hemorrhage, I think they call it. Sarah did have a couple of spots on her face, but they put that down to resuscitation attempts. So all the experts, the medical experts in the 2003, had no evidence of suffocation, but they all were asked, do you know of any other family that's had four sudden infant deaths? And they all went, no. So that's how Meadows Law (laughs) crept into the trial. And there was great discussion about how the children all died of different things. So this is the thing that struck me at the time. And I've got the closing argument here, again, from Mark Tedeschi. And he argues that, yes, the children could have died of these things. And he says lightning never strikes four times, right? Right. Then he goes on, Caleb may have died of a floppy larynx or SIDS. Patrick may have had an acute life-threatening event, which was his first epileptic attack or encephalitis. His death may have been caused by an epileptic attack, an epileptic seizure. Sarah may have had a displaced uvula or SIDS. Lara may have died of myocarditis. Well, yes, ladies and gentlemen, I can't disprove any of that, but one day some piglets might be born from a sow and the piglets might come out of the sow with wings on their back and the next morning Farmer Joe might look out the kitchen window and see these piglets flying out of the farm. So he's basically just said pigs fly. Yeah. But he's also just outlined that the children all died of different things. Like Here's a circumstantial case with no evidence and here's some evidence that explains mm. something else is going on here. But the jury's gone with the the, the, the thing of which there's no evidence. The full for. suspicion. Why do you think that was? The Why diaries. did they find her guilty? So the w- when did the diaries come into play? Craig gave the diaries to the police because he found them and read them. Kathleen f- kept diaries. Yeah. Over yeah. her whole life or yeah. during yeah. yeah. But during this time she diarized quite a lot. And some of her entries are disturbing. I want to read a couple of them. I've got Mm. them here. So in one diary entry, she wrote about her daughter, Laura. She's a fairly good-natured baby, thank goodness. It has saved her from the fate of her siblings. I think she was warned. In another entry, she says, I feel like the worst mother on this earth, scared she'll leave me now like Sarah did. I knew I was short-tempered and cruel sometimes to her and she left with a bit of help. I want to unpack those two because Mm. in isolation they sound damning. Sound terrible. Particularly the part with a bit of help. Yeah. What's Kathleen's explanation for that? What could possibly explain that? She tried to explain herself in 2019 and I've listened to this hours of it being cross-examined by Margaret Canine. She believed, and this is her, what she said, she believed that her thoughts and thinking and stress had some sort of metaphysical effect on her children. And she blamed herself. She thought they chose to leave her because she was a terrible mother. Of course she did. Of course she thought that. Yeah. So (sighs) there's never, ever been any trauma-informed analysis of the diaries, which there has now. Yeah. There's quite a few reports and they're, they're all giving evidence in February. Professor Emma Cunliffe is a professor of law in Canada. She's also an Australian. So she did a big detailed analysis of the diary entries. And, and what she told me is, like, isolated, these sound really distressing. They do. But when you read them in full, it becomes abundantly clear that she's just trying to find answers. Yeah. But in the meantime, she's blaming herself. Of course she is. As soon as I heard that context, because, of course, when I heard read those diaries, I'm like, oh, my God, she's admitted to killing the babies. And I thought, what other possible explanation? But as soon as I heard that and I, I understood that context, mm. I'm not a diary keeper, but, you know, when I've – had uh, miscarriages and and lost a baby late in my pregnancy, I've said all of those things, Mm -hmm. either out loud or to myself. I killed her. I didn't love her enough. I got my hair dyed or it's my fault I did this. Yeah, I thought that You could have easily have read that. I could have written that down and someone could have used that as evidence. I did keep a diary. Yeah. Reads very, very similar. Yes. Like my role as a mother, I saw that my role as a mother was to keep my child alive. He died, therefore I'm at fault. Yes. I'm a massive failure. My body failed him. I did this. Had I not been stressed. Yes. Had I not had my hair streaked. Yep. 
Had I not had that one shot of Botox? Yeah. Had I not had got I, stressed at work? Had I not thought, oh, God, am I making a mistake or, oh, I just want to have some sleep, you know, this baby would have been okay. And I did this with my thoughts, with my behaviour, yeah. with my stress. I don't think there's a woman who's lost a pregnancy mm. or a newborn or a baby or a child who hasn't thought that this yeah. is my fault. I actually thought it was karma with me when Jackson died because I'd done yeah. a story a couple of years earlier and a, a man had suicided afterwards and it just gutted me. And I thought, this is karma. This is, you know. I have a friend who lost a baby and thought it was karma for the abortion that she'd had. Yeah. doesn't help that I've got a Buddhist monk for a brother <laughs> and that's random. But uh, but yes. it's what women do, right? We yeah. blame ourselves. And how could you not? She's a mother. She's had four babies die. Mm. So I want to read another diary entry with that context in mind. Mm -hmm. This is when she was pregnant with Laura. This time I am going to call for help. This time I'll not attempt to do everything myself anymore. I know that that was my main reason for all my stress before and stress made me do terrible things. Mm. She explained in 2019 what she meant by that was that she thought her stress levels affected her children and that they chose not to be around her anymore yeah. by choosing to die. She explained it over and over and over again, but the retired judge, Justice Blanche, found it reaffirmed her guilt. And there's another one. She also referenced her father in the diaries who killed her biological mother, mm. and she said, I am my father's daughter. Mm. She explained what she meant by that in quite detail in 2019. She said, well, I view my father as a loser because he murdered my mother and, you know, he sort of set up some sort of losing pattern in my life mm. and so she was blaming him for all the loss that she'd had and then the inheritance of tragedy and bad luck and karma mm. and mm. death and mm. misery the other thing that was used against her which is oh, why have we not learned the same argument that was used against lindy chamberlain in the court of public opinion which is that she seemed very cold yeah well and one she'd been told by the prosecution not to show any emotion but her girlfriends also talk about the fact that she's What do all, you mean she was told not well, to Well, you show. know, defence lawyers will say, don't react. They still tell you that, don't react. But why? Because the jury might read something into it. Oh, and that ends up working against... Against women. ...the defence, against women, because this idea that a woman should be, you know... A blubbering mess. ...wrenching, mm. tearing her clothes off and collapsing on the ground. Mm. And if she's not... Why not? She's suspicious. Yeah. She's not a good mother. So Craig got on she the stand and did. he was devastated and she never got on the stand. But when she was found guilty, she let out this guttural scream, like almost animalistic journos at the time were talking about. And this woman who's lost four babies is found guilty of their murder mm -hmm. and manslaughter. She's sent to jail for how long? At that time, 40 years, but uh, it's... On appeal, it got reduced to 25 years. After the break, Jane breaks down what this could all mean for Kathleen's future. What's changed? Why is there a new inquiry? Because she's appealed it a number of times and mm. she's lost on appeal. Okay, so the first inquiry was held in 2019. That came about because, as Attorney General Mark Speakman said at the time, the idea that more than one sudden infant death is unusual is now wrong. We know that. So that inquiry was held in 2019. Plenty of evidence was given there that Laura likely died of myocarditis. Still, they went with the diaries. What happened at the end of that inquiry is this genetic breakthrough. So Professor Carola Vinweiser from ANU University had been approached by Folbig's lawyers to do some DNA testing. So they got some Kathleen blood and they tested against the blood spot of the four children. And this is when they found that the two girls had a mutation that they inherited from their mother on the carmodulin gene. Now, this gets quite tricky <laughs> on the CARM2 gene. So mutations on these genes are very rare. And they're one of the genes that are the most stable throughout evolutionary history because they're so important. These genes control how your heart beats. Mm, whether you live or die. It controls the regular rhythm mm. of your heart. So if you find a mutation 
on one of the three calm genes, calm modulin genes, that's very suspicious. So they tried to put that evidence in 2019 and it was clear that nobody really got it because it was so new. Mm. So after that, a couple of Danish professors, well, professors from all around the world, research scientists from all around the world started collaborating on this. Now, in Denmark, professors Met Nyagard and Michael Tour Overgaard isolated this mutation. They reproduced it in a bacteria so that they could see how it performed in a test tube. And they found that this mutation interfered with calcium binding. Now, calcium is really important. We think about it when we drink our milk and, mm. you know, we don't even think about calcium is the thing, calcium and sodium and potassium. They're the ions that tell our heart to contract and pump. And they need a protein to do that. And that's the carmodulin protein. And it lets those ions into the heart muscle cells to tell it to pump. If you've got a mutation on these particular genes and they've been able to compare this to existing mutations that they know cause long QT syndrome and a couple of others that cause cardiac arrhythmias. So now they could compare this particular mutation and compare it to these other diseases that they know are caused by other mutations on the carmodulin genes and they found, yes, it does the same thing. So in summary... There have been developments in science mm. that have allowed scientists to see mm. patterns yep. and causal links in the death of two out of four of mm -hmm. Kathleen's babies yeah. that changed the game. It did change the game. So 27 scientists produced a paper, peer-reviewed, in the Europace Journal in 2021, and that's what sparked this entire new inquiry because – they concluded in that paper that the children, Laura and Sarah, likely died of long QT syndrome, cardiac arrhythmia, mm. brought on by their current infections that they had at the time. And if they did, you can't rule out that Patrick and Caleb didn't Patrick have... Patrick and Caleb didn't have that mutation. They didn't carry the mutation. I see. So it was SIDS, likely epilepsy, and then this mutation that mm. caused the death of the girls. Mm. But because they were tried as a block yeah. before deaths, the whole case falls over if two of them Correct. died of natural causes. So we're, again, Mark Speetman called another inquiry because... How many people signed this? Because uh, right. so Australians of the Year scientists mm -hmm. So there were 27 it. scientists that concluded that the children died, likely died of mm -hmm. cardiac arrhythmias. A petition was then put forward by Kathleen Folbig's lawyers again. And that has now been signed by 151 eminent scientists, including two Nobel laureates, Peter Doherty and Elizabeth Blackburn. And that petition was put to the governor, so Mark Speakman has now called this new inquiry. So we've just been in this inquiry this week, which has Who's only sat there, for Jane? two days. Professors Met Nyagard and Michael Toff Overgaard gave their evidence yesterday. They were the ones that isolated the mutation and proved that it affected calcium binding in the heart. And why are they doing this? Why are these scientists all getting involved? Well, science is a really competitive field, but Michael Toft Overgaard was one of the first people to isolate a mutation on a carmodulin gene back in 2012. So he's been interested in carmodulin for 10 years. But the 171 scientists... Obviously believe there's been a miscarriage of justice. Yeah. Mm. Is Kathleen in court? No. This inquiry is set down. Well, it's now been adjourned till next February. <sighs> and Tom Bathurst in court yesterday said when all this scientific evidence was presented, he said, I'm going to look at everything. I'm not just going to look at the science. I am going to look at everything, including the diaries. So next year in February, that two-week block had been put aside for the diaries. But there was a spectacular development as well. There were three critics of the original paper, cardiologists, who said, well, long QT system, cardiac arrhythmia is not really caused by temperatures that the two girls had that sparked that. That pathology is usually in older children. Now, it's such a rare thing, and this is a new mm. mutation, so mm. it's such a rare thing that there's not much literature about it. 
But the cardiologist, Skinner and Kirk, had said, well, if that happens, a temperature affecting cardiac arrhythmia is more in those syndromes that are reliant on sodium chains, not calcium chains, into the heart. So Michael Toft Overgaard went, well, we should test that. So they tested the same mutation and lo and behold, it affects sodium chains as well. What does that mean? Well, sodium... In layman's language. Oh, gosh, this is a hard bit, isn't it? Uh, Sodium and calcium in the exact right proportions make your heart contract. And if there are mutations on those genes, the proteins that allow calcium and sodium into your heart cells, the binding of that can slow it down. Therefore, your interval between your beats is longer and that causes cardiac arrhythmias. I want to ask you about her and her life. She's been in jail. 19 years. 19 years. How old is she now? 55. What's her life like in jail? Well, for the first couple of years, she was in isolation for her own protection. Because? She would be beaten up. People, she, she has been beaten up several times. People found guilty of killing their children are it's at, the at worst. risk in yeah. prison. It's the worst. Jail justice. Yeah. So she was in isolation and she was beaten up. Yeah. She is now in the Clarence Correctional Centre in Grafton and she now shares a block with, I think, five or six other women. So it's a, it's a lot more relaxed. Which she, women? I did apply to get in, but, of course, they don't let you. I in. once <laughs> heard that all the women, the high-profile cases of women who have been found guilty of murdering their children, they're all housed together in a unit? I had not heard that. But mm. she she has reported that to her friends, because I'm only getting this mm. through her friends, that the tide seems to have turned. People are starting to believe that she's actually innocent. I heard that actually from one of her friends who mm. I knew and who used to go and visit her. Mm. Tell me about that group of friends. Well, remarkably loyal I don't think that my school friends would stand, well, one or two would. (laughs) But if I was accused of murder, I think I'd have some fair weather friends that would go, oh, yeah, I was suspicious of her. I always thought she was a bitch. Yeah, exactly. But her friends are so loyal because they know a different Kathleen to the one that presented to court and they saw her as a mother. Mm. Mm. Why do they think she's innocent? What have they said to you? Not the Kath we know, and we saw her as a loving, doting mother. All of her children were well looked after, beautifully dressed, absolutely no signs of abuse. Like, women do kill children. They do. And in those scenarios, there's usually a long history of abuse. And neglect. Yeah. Not in this case. Beautifully dressed, beautifully cared for. Very attentive. Yeah, and the Crown's case was, well, she didn't get any sleep and she just snapped that night and thought, oh, I'll just kill my kids. That's the preposterous thing, you know, reading about some of the circumstantial evidence and this idea that she wanted to get to the gym, she was tired, Craig said she was very stressed. I mean, it just sounded like every new mother that you'd ever known, let alone one that had experienced such trauma in her own childhood, was estranged from her own mother, had lost babies before. Like it sounded like she was doing really well actually. Mm. In fact, one of her friends talked about one of those diary entries when she talked about how she lost it with Laura and she put it down and she went into another room and just let the kid cry. And Megan, her school friend, said, that's not losing it, that's coping. Yes. Better than some. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that's what you're told to do. We've all done it where you just go, I'm not in a good place, I'm going to put the child in a safe myself, place myself. and remove myself from the child. Yeah, That's good parenting. Yeah. What and all he- of that was used against her. Yes, of course. Well, one of the other things that's going to come out next year, because I've read some of the preliminary reports, because psychiatrists have analysed her since. And what they have found is that she does have the ability to disassociate, which she likely learned as an 18-month-old pre, pre-verbal Watching domestic violence, she learned how to shut down Mm. for survival. And she did explain that to one of the psychiatrists. She said, look, I I just had to keep it to myself. It was a self-preservation thing. And in her diaries, she... Keep what to herself? Her distress about her mother losing the children. Yeah. 
It's a yeah. it's a pretty common reaction to trauma. Mm. So, as Tracy Chapman, her friend, a very close friend, says, Tracy's now studying trauma informed counselling. This is how it's impacted on her life. That this is how people with post traumatic stress disorder act. You know, yeah. they're not you know the blubbering masses that that we know. want them to be. Yeah. It's interesting. I was uh, watching an episode of Australian Story about Kathleen and obviously prisoners aren't allowed to give interviews to journalists as far as I know, but they recorded a conversation she was having with, mm. with I think, Tracy or one of her school friends. And hearing her voice, straight away I had to deal with a lot of my own prejudices because – and it was good that, that Tracy then then addressed it. She said, you know, people think that she's going to be screaming, I've been wrongfully imprisoned, <laughs> but we speak every day and we just have normal chats. You can't be in that state of either grief or despair or bitterness all the time. You can't. And yet that's what we want as proof of her innocence. So judgy, isn't it? I experienced a little bit of this myself because I wrote a book after Jackson died and just about that juggle of trying to have a career and have a child and uh, it was a very sort of naughty, you know, 2000s thing. Mm. And I went down to do an interview on a, a Melbourne morning show with, with David Rain and Kim Watkins and David said, I don't understand why you're not crying. <laughs> and I, I sort of looked oh. at him and I said, oh, look, I'm just trying to keep it together here because if I cry, Kim's going to lose it because Kim's had a really tough oh. pregnancy. Yeah. And then, you know, I thought about that later and I thought, what people don't realise is that you actually can't cry 24 hours a day. And for your own survival, you have to put one foot in front of the other and function. Mm -hmm. You have to function. Mm -hmm. And you have to laugh. And at that stage, I had a newborn, you know, I had a, a, a baby that I had to be happy for. Mm -hmm. I couldn't be, you know, miserable Jane all the time. That would be unfair on Sam. He never saw me sad, I don't think. I kept that to myself. All my friends who – I've got one friend who – lost a member of her family and she talked about you've got to put the grief in your pocket mm. and it's there and you're carrying it around with you all the time but you can't be wearing it like a coat 24-7 because – You'll get criticised for it. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I mean if you, you learn that very quickly and very early on that people will avoid you. You mean if you cry oh, all the time? God, yes. yes. God. And then if you don't cry all the time, you're an unfeeling bitch. Yeah. Can't win. I remember one particular friend saying to me, you're so bitter. And I thought, <gasps> well, what do you expect me to be? I can't be happy about it. And oh, I'm wow. still still learning how to grapple with this. And, it, you know, I just think it's really arrogant to, to criticise somebody else's nightmare. <laughs> yeah, gosh, women are really hard on each other. Where's the brochure that maps out how you're meant to behave? Mm. What do you think is going to happen, Jane? Well, three things could happen. It could go back to the Court of Criminal Appeal if Bathurst believes that there is reasonable doubt. He could find that she's still guilty, she stays in jail, and three, she'll get out in 2028, having served her full term. But you know what's interesting about this? Here you have science that gives us answers, and here we have a circumstantial case from 2003. Answers, suspicion. Answers, suspicion. You've got to hope that People are listening to the science. But one of the things that's really come out of this, and this goes back to the entire judicial system, you can call experts and they can all disagree with each other. Where do you find the truth in that? What appetite does the DPP have to keep her in jail and to keep fighting for the conviction? Oh, well, I, I would just, you know, you'd like to think that they want to go where the truth is. But I suspect there's politics. Because they'll need to justify Okay. Well, I mean, if she is found to be innocent, and it goes back to the Court of Criminal Appeal, you know, they have to acknowledge the fact that one of the worst mm -hmm. miscarriages of justice in Australia's white history has happened in our legal system in New South Wales. To a woman mm. who's lost four babies. Mm. Just finally, this sounds like a funny question, but if people want to show their support for Kathleen, how can they do it? 
can they write to her? Yeah, I wrote to her and said, so weird to be doing a podcast about you and I've never met you, but I know so much about your life because so much is on the public record. I mean, you can go onto the website of Justice New South Wales and read all those psychiatric reports. You could read her diaries. They're all there. You could read them in full. And it's interesting when you read them in full because, you know, when you take those bits out and put them all together, it sounds horrendous. But if you read them in context about the ramblings, it's often she's rambling, mm. but you can, as Emma Cunliffe says, you get this sense that she's just trying to find answers, mm. grappling with the unknown. And, you know, there's a long history of where there's suspicion about women and the unknown. You know, we point the finger at them. Did she write back to you? I haven't heard yet. <laughs> I've been down here, so I might have I might have a letter back. But I do hear from her friends that she's she's hopeful and not getting her hopes up too much. It wouldn't be hard to have faith in the legal system to let her out if she's innocent has let her down. So mm. I think she's probably quite nervous. Do you think she'll get out? According to the legal experts that I've spoken to, and there's quite a few of them, if the law is applied the way it's meant to, yes. I hope so. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Whew, what an incredible conversation. I wonder if you also have changed your mind about this case. Thank you so much to Jane Hansen for not only bringing her expertise on this subject, but also for being so open about her own loss and grief. That can't have been easy. If you'd like to listen to her podcast, Mother's Guilt, and I really recommend you do, you'll find it in the show notes. If this has brought up any issues for you, please reach out to Lifeline on 13 11 14. The producer of No Filter is Emmeline Peterson. The executive producer is Eliza Ratliff with sound production by Madeline Juano. I'm Mia Friedman and thank you for having me in your ears. If you'd love unlimited access to everything women are talking about right now, subscribe to Mamma Mia. An annual Mamma Mia subscription includes online access to every Mamma Mia event, our subscriber-exclusive stories, our subscriber-exclusive podcasts and videos from Australia's leading independent women's media brand. 